Okay, we are live. Hi, Drake. Hello, Sarah. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, friend. We are we are live and we just want to welcome you for your support for watching us. And today we have um, another topic that will be awesome. And I can't wait to have Rick tell us the story of today, uh, today's topic. So I'm going to sh show his banner. This is Rick's banner. They make America great. That's the book. And one of the topic that we are, will be talking today will be picking out from one of the 31 story in this amazing book. So I'm just so excited, so excited. Rick. I'm, I'm looking forward to hear this amazing story. So uh, friend, let me introduce you, formally introduce you briefly to um, to our speaker today. Our presenter today is a 10 time nonfiction book author and an authority on American history. He spent most of his adult life living aboard boats and has traveled far and wide in the America. Let's welcome Rick Road. Welcome Rick. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. You ready to go on Harriet Tubman? Yeah, why don't you uh, share briefly a little bit more of your background? So, if okay. we have, yeah, if we have no viewer, they, okay. they get a glimpse of who you are. Yeah, I, I, I wrote nine voting guidebooks, some of them with big publishers, and uh, people really love the local history I put in my original books. And then I decided to write a 10th book after I wrote nine of these voting books just on American history. And lo and behold, it all kind of tied together from Ben Franklin to the 9-11 first responders. I was writing a book on the Ohio River. One of my favorite chapters was on the Underground Railroad. And I talked about Underground Railroad conductors. And undoubtedly, one of my favorites, and we all should know, she's been on the stamp. She's had movies made about her as Harriet Tubman. So we're going to talk about Harriet Tubman today. Harriet Tubman was born in Dorchester County, Maryland. Now, I'm familiar with, quite familiar with Maryland. That's on Maryland's eastern shore near Cambridge. It's kind of swampy land. It's backwater. It's brackish. It's a, it's a swamp, basically. And she was born in a large family, and she was illiterate, never given an opportunity to read and write. She was a small, sickly child. But later, as an underground railroad conductor, she did feats of amazing endurance and got the nickname of Moses. Now, when Harriet, some stories about Harriet I will tell you about, besides her love of her parents, when she was at five years old, she used to rock a little white baby to sleep. And if the baby woke up and cried, she would get whipped. Little, who's going to whip a five-year-old? But these people whipped her. One time she got whipped five times before breakfast, and she they whipped her on the back of the neck. And she still had those scars on the back of her neck all her life from that. Another time, when she was 12 years old, she was in a dry goods store, which is the equivalent of a general store today, or five and five and dime. It didn't have, you know, obviously the grocery stores we had now. And she was talking to another black person, a slave, who was supposed to have been working in the fields. Well, he was not in the fields. He was goofing off in a dry goods store. His owner, overseer, I should say, tracked him down in this store. He saw him. He threw a two-pound lead weight at this bolting man. His aim was poor. It hit poor Herod in the head, knocked her out. She was unconscious for days, almost killed her, and she had migraine headaches the rest of her life from this head trauma, and she had seizures. When a couple of weeks, they put her back in the field of work. So really a tough childhood, some really raw experiences that were really bad. In her early 20s, she had a large family. Two of her brothers said, let's make a break for freedom through the swamps of Maryland. And so three of them get out and they're leaving and they're hungry, they're cold, they're wet. Uh, and her two brothers said, I had enough of this. Let's go back and take a whipping at the plantation. 
So all three of them went back and they, you know, likely got a whipping and they were fed at least and they were warmer. And uh, that same year, Harry said, I'm going to try again without my brothers. They just slowed me down and they, they chickened out. So she did it again by her own on herself. Now, there was a series of safe, what they call them safe houses, underground railroad safe houses. Many people, free blacks, and free blacks don't get enough credit, in my opinion. Quakers, Presbyterians, and Methodists, some religious groups said, you know, this, this slavery situation is bad. We're going to help blacks escape. We're going to have slave house, safe houses. We're going to put them up for the night, maybe tell them the next way to the next safe house till they make their way north to Pennsylvania. And uh, this is, so she found her way north. And she knew enough about those safe houses. And she got her way, or made her way all the way to Pennsylvania freedom. And she like said, well, this is wonderful. I'm free now. I'm not a slave anymore. And she, one of her first trips back to Cambridge, Maryland, was to get her husband, her husband, John Tubman. Her name was Minty Ross when she was born. So she, she, she used her husband's name, John Tubman. And she had a couple different names. You know, Minty, I think, was what she was called as a child. She gets back to her husband and finds him in really a dangerous trip to get back to Cambridge. She finds her husband with another woman. And he says, Harriet, I ain't going back. I'm standing here. I found so-and-so, and I ain't going back with you. Now, Harriet was betrayed. He risked her life for this fool. And he's like, not going back. And she felt like, you know, choking him. I said, he ain't worth the effort of, you know. And then she said, how many, how many other people in this place want to get out of here tonight? She found 12 willing black people to say, yeah, you know how to get out of here? We'll follow you. And she took that adversity, being betrayed by her husband, and use it in the positive and took 12 people back out to Pennsylvania. And that was the beginning of her great career. She got the moniker Moses. That she went made at least 13 trips. And by some accounts, the smallest account, she took 70 people out. Highest account, she took, she took 300 people out over those, those trips. And she used to brag, I never lost a passenger on the railroad. It means everybody that went with her got out. And she'd go in the wintertime. Because in wintertime, the nights are longer, the days are cold, it's colder, and the white people are less inclined to run out and chase people. Also, she'd leave on a Friday night because the next newspaper would get notice for runaway slaves didn't come out on Monday. So she had a two-day head start. So she did all she had, she had this all figured out for an illiterate woman. She was pretty smart. And so she but she took that adversity about her husband basically betraying her and she uses an advantage and she never looked back and she, wonderful career. One of my favorite stories, she carried a gun with her and the gun from experience with her two brothers was like, you know, if you're going to chicken out, I'm going to shoot you. Well, she never had to shoot anybody. She never, you know, she, but she didn't carry the gun and she showed the gun to her passengers who were on the ground or her passengers. But one time she did use the gun, her teeth during one of her trips were infected. And if you ever had a tooth infection, you know how painful that can be. She took the butt end of the gun and knocked her own infected teeth out. Now, that is one tough lady. I don't think I could do that. But she did that during one of her underground railroad trips. She made a, she made a, a, a great conductor. She was known as Modus Moses. And she, filled, she worked out of Philadelphia mostly. And uh, her, her, she went back and forth several times and people down in Maryland. Who is this person getting all these people out? This must, we're going to give her name of Moses. They couldn't believe it was a short five foot woman doing all this. When the civil war started, oh, 10 years after she started doing underground railroad conducting, she worked as a seamstress, a laundress, and a nurse. She didn't know anything about nursing, I don't think, to union soldiers. And during the war, late during the war, there was a raid um, Union soldiers into South Carolina, and she knew the swamp. She was probably working in swamp water up to her breasts or even higher sometimes. And she told the Union soldiers she knew the way through the swamps and got 300 soldiers through the swamps of South Carolina and got thousands of black people free. And she did all this wonderful stuff. And then when she was civil war was over, she didn't stop, you know, fighting for. I don't fight might be now is, is a different word for her people. She uh, started a house in New York for indigenous black people. 
soldiers and wounded soldiers, missing limbs and stuff, and taking care of them. And one time, another very famous Underground Railroad person, or abolitionist, I should say, who used his talent. He had great speaking talents. He made himself literate, and hopefully we'll talk about him as Frederick Douglass. One time, Harry Tubman and Frederick Douglass, they grew up, and they didn't even know each other, but they only grew up miles apart in the same part of Southern Maryland, in the swamps, one county apart. And there were, Frederick Douglass was, or excuse me, Harry Tubman, Tubman was basically, I don't know, giving a speech in front of many people, and she asked Frederick Douglass to say a kind word for her. And this is what Frederick said. I think it's a great, it's just very much about both of them. Uh, Frederick said to Harriet, the difference between us is very marked. Most of what I have done has been in the limelight with people watching me. I have fought in the day. But you, Harriet, have fought by night. The only people that saw your heroism is the stars in the silent sky um, and our trembling bondsmen. You, Harriet, have witnessed your devotion and freedom far beyond what I have ever done. I think, that, I think I misquoted that a little bit. That's the idea of it. I think that says very much a lot positive about both of them, Harriet and Frederick. Well, anyway, so Harriet, so they both, Frederick Douglass was a very literate man. He would argue with, argue with you on the evils of slavery, use the U.S. Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and be correct. And Harriet did, was totally the opposite. She was small, short, frail. And the uh, funny thing is, she outlived everybody else who was an underground railroad conductor. She lived well into the, the 20th century, I think died in 1913. We're not sure when she was born. 1820, 1822, 1823, all different dates. Uh, but when she was an old lady, she was a friend of the Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, another character in my book. And he set a house for her in, in Auburn, New York. Auburn, New York was kind of a, a very, I would, I don't know, good is not the right word, but a place where free slaves were very well accepted and the community took care of them. And Seward was also like that himself. And she took care of a lot of people who didn't have any money. And she put it in her house. And she had one of her sayings that Sarah had, I think, said, if you're tired, keep going. If you're hungry, keep going. If you're scared, keep going. And if you want to taste freedom, keep going. And that really describes Harriet's life. There's some people say that might not be attributed to her, but it definitely captures her spirit and, and her persistence of how to keep doing when it's, when it's uh, when things are not going well, she just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And she had some success and she has some success that helped other people. She, like I said, she lived to be gosh, in her nineties, died in 1913 and she was buried with military honors. That's how far our country had come. Uh, and she's buried in Auburn, New York with military honors. And then when she was dying, her last words were, I could go to prepare a place for you. Very religious woman, religious all her life, and she knew her days were coming to an end, and she basically had a very fruitful life, and she doesn't, like I said, there's a movie made about her, she's on a postage stamp, but not enough is said about her, and uh, just a woman that just of amazing strength, endurance, and perseverance, and whatever else you can say. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rick. Yes, uh, she is an amazing, courageous and tenacious. Tenacious is a good word. Tenacious, yes, yes. yes. Um, thank you. And let me show you, let me show the audience her picture. This is Harriet Tubman, the tough, tenacious lady. Yeah, wonderful woman. And the book again, let me show the, the picture of the book again. They made America great. Yep, uh, Harry Tubman is one of the 30, 31 uh, figures that Rick was featuring in his book. And the book is available on Amazon and on his website, rickroads.com, as you can see on the screen there. And that's wonderful. I have some question for you. Sure. So um, just want to know what drew you 
to under, underground railroad conductor Harry Thomas for your 10 nonfiction book. Well, I knew her story a little bit living in Maryland, Southern Maryland. And on my, I think my eighth book on the Ohio River, one of my favorite chapters was on the Underground Railroad. And it, I have developed that into a program. And I started looking at some of the Underground Railroad conductors. And they are many. There are many good sources on that. And Harriet Tubman stood out. Now, when I heard the story, she knocked her teeth out with the butt of <laughs> I was like, man, this lady, this lady's, I got to learn more about this lady. She's, she's, you know, I couldn't, I've had the toothache, but I don't think I could ever take a, something like a, that hard and knock my teeth out. So yes, this is a wonderful lady. <laughs> uh, so the next question I want to know, what did you especially like about Harriet Tubman? Well, her courage. Uh, and she was a little woman, five foot tall. Uh, and she, she, just her courage. Uh, and like I said, there were a lot of great underground railroad conductors, but she was one of the most courageous of all. And it's funny that she, she was the sickliest, sick, sickly child, but she lived well. She outlived everybody else in the underground railroad. It's just an amazing story. And more people, I know there's a movie made about it, but more people ought to read more books about her. She's just a wonderful person. Hmm. Yeah, now is the chance you can uh, read the uh, summarized version in in Rick's book. So, um, my next question, I just want you to tell us a bit more about that Underground Railroad. Well, we have three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Underground Railroad was a movement. It's no, it wasn't a real railroad. As soon as slaves were in the South, the North had some slavery too early on, but it was pretty much gone by the turn of the uh, 18th century, or not, I guess the 19th century. And people knew it was wrong. And there were people that spoke out, including Benjamin Franklin, about slavery. They were called abolitionists. But some people wanted to do more than that, more than the, the action arm of the abolitionists were underground railroad conductors. They were free blacks, certain religious groups, Quakers, Methodists, Presbyterians, and others that said, we're going to help get those blacks out of the uh, United States. And don't think our country can't pass bad laws. In 1793, we passed the first Fugitive Slave Act. And it basically was a slave was in Pennsylvania, and he was caught by people and sent back to uh, the South. And what that did is create a whole new industry. Whenever a U.S. law happens, sometimes a new industry will be created. That uh, industry was slave catchers. And I could talk a lot about that. And so there are people carrying the slave catchers, establishing this network of, of paths from the South. Well, they went to Mexico. They went to the Caribbean. But primarily, they went to Canada. Canada in 1850 was part of Britain. And Canada, Britain didn't have slavery. And so there was no slavery in Canada. And it, 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 in 1850, there's only five countries in the world that still had slavery. Obviously, Britain and Canada, Canada being part of Britain, did not. Burma, Mauritania, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, and the good old United States. So these people knew it wasn't good, so they, they hightailed to Canada. And then in 1850 was the second Fugitive Slave Act that was called that, that helped the people in the south pressured congress to write the second act and it made the north responsible for enforcing southern slavery now how if i was a postmaster let's say in pennsylvania and i knew of a runaway slave well, i had to not tell the slave catching authorities about him i could be fined a thousand dollars that's like twenty five thousand dollars back in that day so the second slave act made the North responsible for forcing Southern slavery. And sometimes when you do something like that throughout history, it backfires. And it did backfire. And the North said, enough is enough. We don't like your institution of slavery. Stop it. And you make us put the second future of slave act in. No, no way. And that increased the activity of the Underground Railroad. More people said, you know what? 
I was sitting on the sidelines till that second Fugitive Slave Act passed. Now I'm getting involved. I'm going to become an underground railroad conductor. Some of the more famous ones were John Brown, John Brown's Raid. Oh, there's a bunch of them. You probably don't even know, but uh, some good books on it. And if you talk to me, I can tell you what the good books are. They're very in-depth about the Underground Railroad. But I found it, the, the subject very interesting. It's one of the first uh, resistance movement in this country early on. And people didn't, they were breaking U.S. laws to do the right thing. And God bless them. They were doing the right thing. So I think the Underground Railroad is a very fascinating subject. I think the Underground Railroad conductors, all of them were very heroic people. And I really think it's a subject that is near and dear to my heart. And, and Harriet Tubman was one of the more interesting, to say the least, Underground Railroad conductors. Thank you, Sarah. Mm. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, that's very good uh, history to know. So again, here's the picture of the book. They made America great. It's available on Amazon and and also on Rick website, rickroads.com. And um, here is the picture of Harriet Tubman again, the, the tough, tenacious, and courageous lady. All five feet of her. <laughs> She's one inch taller than me. So. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for sharing this wonderful history. And this is the um, the program, the uh, history chat that um, we just started a couple of weeks ago, and we thought that it would be fun. It would be nice to learn about some of the unsung heroes that you know people don't know don't know about how hero heroic the people are. They love the country, they love the people, and they did a lot of amazing things. And we need to learn about them. Thank you. We do. Yes. So. Um, um, if you need to reach out to me for any reason, I'll show my banner quickly so you can have, take a snapshot of, and you can uh, find me there. Um, SarahM.com is my website. And uh, let's see. Okay. And... I think that's uh, that's it for today. And we, I enjoy the story that you share with us, Rick. Every every subject that you brought up so far, it's very fascinating. So, yeah, L listener, you will have a treat. You get a storyteller telling the story for you right here. So Thank follow you. us. Next Thursday, we'll do it again. And uh, the time might vary slightly. This is the, the time of the month that I am quite busy. So I'll try to be consistent as possible. Hopefully, we can fit into the 2 o'clock schedule again. If not, we'll move to the morning like today. So um, thank you so much for watching. And um, you have an amazing day. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Do we have any question? I don't see any question. So, yeah, I'm waiting to see the question. Feel free to ask. So, we wait for one more minute. <laughs> one more minute. <laughs> I love questions. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of amazing people in the history of America. They are. Yeah, that, that's why America is growing so fast. So fast because... Well, yeah. America is an idea. It's not any group of people. It's an idea. And it's changed a bit. And that's good, you know. We had slavery in the Constitution. We wouldn't have put it together without slavery. 
you know, and Ben Franklin knew that he was, it was a devil. It was, what's it called? What a devil's choice. And we had a civil war fought over it. All right. It doesn't seem like we have any questions. So we just say goodbye one last time. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for watching.